Welcome to Chapter 5 in OpenStax Astronomy. This is the first video of several that cover the chapter on radiation and spectra. In this chapter, we're going to talk about light, all the different types of light that exists, and how astronomers use it to gather information about distant objects. This is probably the single most important chapter in the textbook, and so we're going to spend a lot of time making sure we understand it. So this first video is going to cover the um, introduction to light itself, as well as the different types of light that exist. So our discussion starts with the question, what is light? It's a tougher question than you might think, and although there are a lot of different scientists that contributed to all of this, we're going to focus our brief history on three different milestones. We don't have to memorize names or dates, but it's important to understand the scientific process is a long one. So we start back in 1704. Isaac Newton published an, an optics textbook that was used for over 100 years. And in it, he suggested that light is a particle. He had sent uh, white light, sunlight, through a prism and seen the different rainbow. You may have seen this um, yourself through um, different glass. And his big idea that fit the observations he was seeing, his model, was that light is made up of several different particles at any given time that have different colors and then you can add them together and they create white light. And that seemed to do okay for over 150 years. And then we started to have an alternate possibility. James Maxwell published a big treatise on electricity and magnetism. So electricity, like what comes out of our wall sockets, magnetism, like what you um, use to put a grocery list on the fridge. And his big thought was that electricity and magnetism are not two separate pieces of physics, but are rather intricately connected in what's called the electromagnetic field. And in physics, any time that you have a field, it means you can have waves that go through that field. Gravity is a um, field, gravitational field, and we have in the last several years discovered gravitational waves. W uh, light works the same way. If there is an electromagnetic field, Maxwell suggested that there should be electromagnetic waves. It took two decades for there to be a major breakthrough on the experimental side, but in 1888, Heinrich Hertz was able to produce radio waves and then detect them, and they were um, completely what Maxwell's um, theory predicted, how they behaved, how they interacted with each other, everything. And so everyone kind of agreed in the late 1800s that light really was a wave. Okay, so if light is a wave phenomenon, then we want to think about what that means for how we can talk about light and describe it. It's worth recognizing that sound is also a wave phenomenon. If you've ever heard the phrase sound waves, um, the fact that you are hearing my voice is because my voice is kind of shaking the air, it's shaking my microphone, and then getting transmitted digitally. But when it comes out of your speaker, then it shakes the air and gets to your eardrums. And so you are experiencing the transfer of energy from my vocal cords to your eardrum. Okay, light, similar idea. I have a light bulb above my head. It is transmitting light from the light bulb to my eyes and that energy is also moving. So let's think briefly about how these two more general everyday waves are similar to each other and how they might differ. So a pause and think question for us. Pause the video once I've read the question so you can th think through what your answer should be. Which of these four statements below is true? Only one of them is able to be true, so decide which one makes the most sense to you. Okay, hopefully you pause. Um, and if you read through those, one thing that we should have been able to do quite quickly is throw out the options that didn't allow light to travel through empty space. We can see the sun, we can see the moon when sunlight is shining from it, we can see distant stars. The fact that we're seeing those things is because light is traveling through distant space, empty space. So the only reasonable options for us, if we make that important critical thinking step, 
is options one and two. So hopefully we narrowed it down to that. That's really what I needed us to be able to think through. And then the piece of science that we might not have um, come across before, and it's totally fine if we haven't, is that sound cannot travel through empty space. Sound requires the air molecules in the room to be able to shake those molecules along the path of motion. The big difference between these two types of waves is how the wave itself, the, um, the variation, the disturbance, is based on the direction of motion. Sound waves require particles to be compressed and rarefacted along the path that that, light, uh, that sound wave is going. Light, on the other hand, creates a disturbance that is perpendicular to the motion, kind of like waves in a jump rope. There are animations at um, the link here, and I really do recommend that you, um, that you take a moment to view those after this video. But it's worth recognizing that light behaves differently than sound waves do. And so we are able to get light from distant objects. We are not able to hear distant objects. If you have ever come across um, any kind of media where it talks about um, the sounds of the sun, what they're doing is they're visibly seeing the sun shake a little bit and translating that into what that could look like if there weren't a vacuum of space. Now, the other important thing to note before we continue is that light, when we use it in this class, what we mean is electromagnetic radiation. And that means energy is transferred from one place to another, and we're talking about electromagnetic energy, and we're, talk about, we're talking about it being transferred through electromagnetic waves. When we use light in everyday circumstances, what we really mean is visible light, but that is not the only type of light that exists. And we'll be talking in, at the end of this video about the different types that exist. Now, in order to be a wave, there are certain properties that we can use to describe any wave, whether it is light waves or sound waves or waves on a um, lake surface or waves along a jump rope that we're shaking up and down. Every single wave can be described using a couple key properties. The first really important one for us to get used to is wavelength. Wavelength is often um, using the symbol lambda, it's a Greek letter lambda, instead of writing out the word wavelength. And what it is, is it's a measure of the distance between like points on a wave. So from one crest to another crest, or from one trough to the next trough. It's measured in meters, although we will often see nanometers or other variants. It's just a length that we care about. So that length is the important part for us. Frequency is another aspect of waves. Frequency uses the letter F, uh, which stands for frequency, and it's a count of the number of waves that pass a point in a single second. So maybe there are five waves that pass by in a single second, or maybe there are five million waves that pass in a single second. No matter what that number is, it is measured in hertz. Um, from Heinrich Hertz that we had talked about a couple of slides ago. Now, we can write a somewhat straightforward relation between these wave properties, that the speed of the wave is equal to frequency times wavelength. What is really important for us to understand and worth writing down in all capital letters and highlighted is that all forms of light travel at the same speed in empty space. The speed is called the speed of light and it uses the symbol C. So that for light waves, rather than a generic um, phrasing of speed, we can write specifically that C equals F times lambda that the speed of light is equal to the frequency of the light times the wavelength of the light. And at the bottom here, we have a kind of summary of all three of those key properties for us. And although it gives us the number values for the speed of light in meters per second and miles per second, we do not need to memorize those. All right, now a couple of questions for us to make sure we're understanding these key terms. So. Pause the video and read through the questions and the options so that you answer both of these. Okay. So if the distance between wave crests is increased, 
then the wavelength is by definition also increased. The top answer here is two. If we have a peak to peak distance that we're calling the wavelength and we stretch that out so that the distance between these two peaks is bigger, then the wavelength is a bigger number. However, if the distance between those wave creases in wave crests increase, like we said, then the frequency is going to get smaller. If we're letting that wave pass by us and it's all spread out and stretched like that, fewer total waves are going to pass through every single second and the frequency will decrease. So the bottom answer here is three. So two on top and three on the bottom. Now, we come back to this idea of what is light. If the answer were simply that it's a wave, then we wouldn't have that difficult lead up. The problem is, in the late 1800s, there were a couple of experiments where the wave theory of light could not explain what was going on. So they were black body radiation and the photoelectric effect. Now, for black body radiation, we are going to learn all about what that is, all of the um, science behind that, in a later video in this chapter, in chapter 5. So I'm not going to get into the details of what it is quite yet. The one thing I'll note here is that the problems associated with how it worked would be fixed if light were sent away by hot objects in little packets rather than this continuous wave that was always leaving. So if light is emitted in quantized packets of pieces instead of a continuous wave, then black body radiation would work the way that we, we observe it. The other effect here, the photoelectric effect, this picture here is um, referencing the photoelectric effect. When light hits metal, it is possible for an electron to be kicked off the metal. But the way that that photoelectric effect worked was only possible if light were being sent out in little packets that had different amounts of energy. And so in 1905, Albert Einstein explained that light is absorbed by objects in little quantized amounts, little packets. Now, the photoelectric effect is not part of our curriculum, so I'm not going to get into the details of it. You're welcome to look it up um, on your own, but the one way that I can make sure we understand how important it was that we figured out how light works is that out of all of the different things that Albert Einstein is known for and one of the most famous scientists in our culture, this is the only thing that he won a Nobel Prize for. He only won the Nobel Prize for explaining the photoelectric effect, even though he made all of these other contributions to science. Okay, so as it turns out, light can act as a wave and as a particle. It is hard for us to try to visualize what that looks like, and that's okay, but we need to recognize that that is a true statement. And the way that we talk about little pieces of light is by calling them a single piece of light would be called a photon, as if you're taking a photo. Photons carry energy just like the waves that we talked about, and so photons actually still have frequency and wavelength and all of those key wave properties. They just don't have any mass. So they're massless particles that move at the speed of light c, just like we had talked about for the wave nature of light. The other key thing to consider is that when we think of an object as being bright or dim, all we are really talking about is how many photons we are detecting every single second. Or if we're talking about how truly bright and not how apparently bright an object is, how many photons that object is emitting every single second. We will be returning to these ideas of absolute brightness and apparent brightness and how, how the um, distance from an object changes that in a later chapter, but it's worth noting this is where the book introduces that idea. Okay, so a single photon, a single little particle of light has a certain amount of energy. Now the equation here shown on the slide, we won't use again. It probably won't even come back up in our curriculum, but it does have a really succinct way of showing all of the relationships between a energy, 
frequency, and wavelength. So we can either understand that, um, understand that equation, or we can understand that high frequency light waves have short wavelengths and high energy, and low frequency light waves would have long wavelengths and low energy. Or we can just kind of make sure we understand which things are directly proportional and which ones are inversely proportional. That's what this um, equation is trying to show us, but if we prefer writing it all out in words, that's okay too. Okay, so if we start to understand then that light has all of these different possible wavelengths and frequencies and energies, we would want to categorize them so that we can talk about different ranges of wavelengths and energies. So the range of all possible wave frequencies and wavelengths, when we put them in order, is called the electromagnetic spectrum. And you can write it out as EM spectrum so that you're not writing out electromagnetic all the time. And before we go into all of the different types of light, I want to ask us this question. It's a think pair share just like um, the others. But I want us to consider which of the following listed here is not a form of light in the electromagnetic spectrum. All right. Now the reason this is a tricky question is because we as a civilization have developed technologies that use different types of light and then we've named those technologies after that type of light. So radio waves are a form of light. When we think about radio waves, we think about listening to the radio in our car or something like that, where we're talking about sound now instead of light. But the radio in our car, the piece of technology, is detecting radio waves. Right now, in the room that you're sitting in, if you turned on the radio, it would play music. What that means is there is invisible radio waves, a form of light, that are all throughout the room um, around you, and that your radio is able to detect that electromagnetic radiation. You're not constantly hearing all of the different radio stations. That tells us already that radio waves are not a form of light, are not a form of sound. They are a form of light. Microwaves in our kitchen. Microwaves use microwave light to shake the water molecules on our food, actually. We don't need to know that detail, but it's kind of interesting. Microwaves use a specific wavelength of light that causes um, the water molecules in our food to shake around and then heat everything up. So the technology was named after the form of electromagnetic radiation that it was using. And then x-rays, whether it's at the doctor or the dentist or some distant... Um, uh, astronomical object, x-rays, the machine used in everyday circumstances in doctor's office or dentists, the machine uses x-ray light, the form of electromagnetic radiation that we call x-rays, in order to take pictures below the surface um, of a human body. So to take pictures of your teeth or to take pictures of your bones. So the answer here is that all of them are a form of light. So any time that we see an electromagnetic spectrum diagram. So this one here uh, shows us a whole bunch of different information. You can certainly look several up um, online to get a sense of the different, um, the different ways that all of this is depicted. If we look at this on this particular um, example, long wavelengths, big number wavelengths are shown on the left. In this second example, big number wavelengths are shown on the right. I need us to always be aware that if we look at diagrams in the book or online, that we need to review the labeling and not just assume that left always means one thing or the other. So let's go back to that first example. This is nice because it gives us a sense of what those wavelength numbers mean. So remember, wavelength is the distance between um, one peak to the next peak of the wave. And so when we think about radio waves, like what our cars are able to pick up, the peak to peak distance is like the size of a house. It's huge. It's a big wavelength. Um, and 
what that means for us, and that's an important thing for us um, to consider, is that big number wavelengths means small number energy. The fact that the room around us is filled with radio waves is not dangerous to us because the energy is really, really low. If we jump around and look at a light bulb, for example, when we see an incandescent light bulb, what we are seeing is visible light. It is a very, very narrow band of wavelengths, kind of in the middle of all of this, um, where we are seeing only what our eyes are able to detect out of all of these wavelengths and all of these frequencies. Now, I like this picture to I like to include this picture in the slide so that you can look back at it, but I'm actually going to move on to the next one, which has a little bit less going on. So it's a little bit less chaos to um, to look over. And so in our textbook, we are more often going to see short number wavelengths on the left side. So gamma rays are the shortest wavelength of light. They are the highest energy form of light. And no matter how small the wavelength is, all the way out to the smallest number you can think of, we still give, give that the term gamma rays. So it goes out to all possible extremes on that end. Already with the understanding we have before this class, anything that we've ever picked up about when gamma rays are commented on, whether that's the Incredible Hulk and how he was able to turn green and angry, or whether we're thinking about different sci-fi weapons, gamma rays, we already have the intuition that they're kind of scary sounding or dangerous sounding. That's helpful to us. That helps us recognize that they're on the high energy side of the electromagnetic spectrum. X-rays as well. We know that um, we only ever get X-rays when we need to. And even then, if we think about um, getting dental X-rays or X-rays for a broken bone, they like cover everything else up with that thick layer that protects us from X-rays because they are really high energy. They're necessary to be able to take a picture below the skin surface, but they are dangerous in large quantities. So we limit our exposure. Next up is ultraviolet, so UV is often what it's um, shortened to. And UV, if we think about sunscreen and sunblock, we know that we're supposed to wear sunscreen to protect us from ultraviolet light. So the fact that we need protection from this form of light can also help us recognize that we have that intuition to know that it's high energy light. Then there's that tiny narrow band of visible light uh, right in the middle there. Then right past the red side of the visible light. So ultraviolet is kind of like extreme violet. Then there's violet in the rainbow. Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. And then infrared, which is kind of like extreme red. Too red for our eyes to see, I suppose. Infrared is actually what we humans produce. We are constantly glowing, not in the visible, but we are glowing in the infrared, so night vision goggles can pick up people and animals because they're warm enough to produce infrared light. Terahertz shows up on this scale in our um, astronomy curriculum. We're not going to worry about that as a separate type of light. From infrared, we'll move into microwave, and from microwave, we end with radio waves. Radio waves are the lowest um, energy the fact that they're all throughout all of our everyday environments kind of helps us understand that that must be low energy for it to be safe for them to be all over the place. We don't have sunblock or sunscreen for radio waves. Okay, now out of all of these forms of light, they're listed on the top of the, this new slide, there are actually only a few types of light that make it down to Earth's surface. Visible light is the one that we can probably have guessed does make it down to Earth's surface, but radio waves, a, a big window of wavelengths in the radio, also make it down to Earth's surface, and we build a lot of radio telescopes on the ground on Earth because we can do a really good job collecting that type of light to study. If we want to study gamma rays or X-rays or microwaves, we have to send a telescope up into space. We'll talk about that more in chapter six, but the one thing I want to point out on this picture before we move on is that it is really good for us that Earth has a thick atmosphere with molecules like ozone in it 
because those molecules protect us from gamma rays and x-rays, those extremely high energy forms of light. They are blocked by Earth's atmosphere. That is one of the necessary requirements for being able to survive here on Earth, is that we have specific molecules in our atmosphere that will block the high energy forms of light from getting through. All right. So a pause and think question for us as we start to consider all of those different types of light that exist. I want you to think through and pause the video so that you can write down your answer to each of these. These aren't multiple choice questions in the sense of A, B, or C, or one, two, or three, but out of the list of types of light that we talked about, which ones fit the descriptions here? Okay, so let's pause the video. All right, so out of all of the different types of light that we talked about, radio waves have the least energy, gamma rays have the shortest wavelengths, radio waves have the lowest frequency, and the last question was a trick. I was wondering if you wrote in all capital letters highlighted that all forms of light travel at the same speed. So none of these um, forms of light travels the slowest when we're talking about the circumstances in our course in astronomy of light traveling through the emptiness of space. So if we got stuck on that one, not a big deal, but maybe write it a second time in all caps and highlight it that all forms of light travel at the same speed. All right, and then this question is a lot wordier, so you're going to have to pause the video just to make sure that you can read all of the questions before I give the, or the options before I give the answer. But which of the following statements would be true if we were comparing x-rays and radio waves? All right. So as with all of the questions that I try to ask us in this class, we're always trying to use critical thinking. You are not meant to just read through these and just have the answer spring out of your head. What's important to do is to go through each option and decide whether it seems like it could work or whether there's something we know that we could throw that option out. So question one, radio waves don't have more energy than x-rays because radio waves are nice and safe and are in the room around us, x-rays are really dangerous and we only take x-ray pictures when we need to. So one, we throw out from the intuition that we have before this class started. Option two, radio waves have higher frequency and travel the same speed as x-rays. That one isn't right, but it would be hard for us with this brand new information to remember where the high frequency side and low frequency side are because we're still building an understanding of um, frequency. So although two is incorrect, if you picked it, that's kind of a decent second choice um, while we're still trying to learn what frequency means for us. Option three, radio waves have a lower frequency and travel faster than x-rays. As soon as we read that we're traveling different speeds, we throw that option out. So three is gone. Option four, radio waves have less energy and would travel slower than x-rays. All forms of light travel at the same speed. We've written it twice now in all caps and highlighted. We throw that option out as well. And then option five, radio waves have longer wavelength and travel the same speed as x-rays. That is the correct answer. Option five is the correct answer here. And hopefully if we felt uncomfortable with the answers here, that we take a moment to go back and review those, um, those diagrams in the slides. Even if you don't want to rewatch the video, that's fine. But that's why those, um, those slide diagrams are included. So you can go back and maybe even copy them into your notebook so that you start to feel more comfortable with these different forms of light. So I will see you in the next video.